Well, good morning, First Presbyterian Church. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. My name is Kelly, and here are a few announcements on this beautiful Trinity Sunday where we are worshiping God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And before we do, we also want to say Happy Father's Day. That is a big thing as well. To all the dads out here, we're so glad that you came here to just begin your celebrations and hope that you are loved on in big ways. And we also know that the role of father, it, it's a really important role. And also we want to remember some of the fathers who may not be with us here today, present, but are with us in spirit. We want to remember and acknowledge them as well. So this coming Tuesday, we welcome the Presbytery of West Jersey right here in our own church. And our own Doug Derry will be installed as the moderator of our Presbytery. This key leadership position is a post that Doug will hold for one year, and he'll moderate all Presbytery meetings over the next year. He'll attend ordinations of new ministers and installations of pastors starting new ministries. He'll be a big servant leader for the 60 churches of our Presbytery, so it's a very big role to take on. So please uh, keep Doug and Martha Derry in your prayers. And if you'd like to witness his installation, this meeting occurs at 7 o'clock this Tuesday, and he will be installed at about 7.30. So if you'd like to support him and celebrate, we would love to have you. I will be there with bells and whistles on. Also, tomorrow night is a really great event. It's our women's gathering. All women from all Presbyterian churches and beyond the Presbyterian church, of course, are welcome. It's a great event. It's a spring gathering where we all gather to celebrate um, wonderful ministries and also to hear stories. And our very own Debbie Brins of Valley, she's the executive presbyter for our presbytery. She will be speaking and sharing an awesome talk called Four Letter Words tomorrow evening. And that's at 6.30 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. So please, women of all ages are welcome to come to that. And also one more date to mark your calendar, Sunday, October 27th. So this is a little down the road, but this is a really big date for our church. This is the day when our church will leave the building to go be the church in Morristown and beyond. So what does this mean? It means that on that day we'll have a slightly different, shorter worship schedule with no educational hour. So there will be mission and service projects for everyone, from, for every skill level and every energy level. So from small children to your oldest uh, seniors. And starting in late September, you'll have the chance to sign up to serve on that day. But we're also looking for leaders. And what this means is it's pretty simple. Maybe one opportunity to serve will be cleaning up a local park or painting a neighbor's fence. And so all being a leader requires is that you just uh, talk to Linda Jagiella and just say, I would like to be a leader to host a service group, and she would love to introduce you to an opportunity, or if you have an idea of a service project you would like to do, please let her know too. We are open to a lot of wonderful ideas because we have a lot going on. So right now, please talk to her to sign up or also to become a leader for that. And friends, we'd also like to encourage you to sign up. If you have not registered at your attendance, there is a sign-up clipboard over there. It's really important that we know who's here so we learn how we can serve you all in really meaningful ways. So don't forget to sign in if you've done that, if you haven't done that. So friends, this is the day that the Lord has created, so let us rejoice in his grace and might. Amen. Amen. Could you stand and join us? Good morning. This is a new song, so you have to help us because we don't know it that well, so... We can learn it together, okay? Every 
praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Tasted and 
sing of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are welcome here come fly this place and fill the atmosphere your glory feel like you need to sit down, you can. I don't want to encourage you to, to worship if you can. Yeah. 
spirit break out Break the walls down Everything, everything Spirit break out Heaven come down Our Father erupt with praise you can hear it the sound of heaven touching earth the sound of heaven touching earth our father all of heaven rose your name sing louder let this place erupt with praise you can
We want to see your kingdom here. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may sit down. Thank you, Lord. We do want to see your kingdom here this morning. This is the call to confession. And when I was a kid, I remember dreading this part. I didn't want to uh, say the things I had done wrong. And as my faith grew, I realized that Jesus gives us this freedom to tell him, to talk to him. Um, and maybe this week we were just far away. Maybe something went really wrong. And maybe something went really wrong a long time ago. But this is our time with God. We're certain he's here. Um, we felt his presence in, in, our, in the songs we started with. So let's bow our heads. Let's pray together. Let's tell Jesus how much we love him. Amen. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed, for we were gone astray like sheep, but now have been returned to the shepherd and the guardian of our souls. The good news is this. Jesus Christ we, we are sought, we are found, and we are forgiven. So now, um, Jesus, God teaches us to love one another, and, and Jesus showed that to us, and that we can love each other, we can even love who we hate, um, and, you know, who we dislike. So please stand now. Let's give the peace, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, peace be with you. Come forward, I have something I want to share with you. Come on forward. Hi, Eli. Hi, Adeline. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you guys. How are you? You good? You good? So this morning, Today, I wanted to share with you our way of the week, which is something a little bit different for our children's moment. But each week we've been doing a way of the week, and today's way of the week, are you listening? Got your listening ears on? Is worship with your whole heart. And I have a secret. 
So I want you to listen because I'm going to whisper because I don't want the moms and dads to hear this. Okay? All right? Are you listening? Are you listening? When we say worship with your whole heart, you guys do this better than the moms and the dads. You do. I see it right here. I saw it this morning. Helena, you were doing it. You were dancing in the aisles. I saw you. You were worshiping with your whole heart and your whole body. Good job. Good job. That's what worship with your whole heart means. And you know what else? There was a man, there was actually an adult in the Bible who did this. His name was King David. And in the Bible, the Bible tells us that King David, who was an adult, actually danced before the Lord with all his might. Now, in case you don't know what that looks like, I'm going to tell you what that looks like. How many of you know the hokey pokey? Raise your hand if you know the hokey pokey. Do you know the hokey pokey? Yeah? Okay. Do you guys know the hokey pokey? All right. The hokey pokey goes like this. You put your right hand in. You put your right hand out. You put your right hand in. And what do you do? You shake it all about, right? And then you do your left hand. And then you do your right foot and your left foot and your head. And then what's the last thing that you do? Cool. Before you turn around, what do you put in? Your whole self, right? You put your whole self in and you shake it all about. That's what worship with your whole heart should look like. You write your whole heart. It should be your whole self. You want to put your whole self into worship. Now, does that mean that every time we come to worship, you should do the hokey pokey? No, no, no. Sometimes worship means that we are praying, right? Sometimes when we come to worship, we pray. But that means that we should use our whole body, all of our mind, and all of our heart to be praying too, okay? All right? We can do it quietly, but we still use everything that we can to do that. When we're singing, some of you sing. And when you sing, you are singing those words directly to God. Sometimes when you do that, that's worshiping. That's true worship from your heart. You're forgetting that there are people that you're singing to as well. You remember that you're singing to God directly. That's true worship. That's what worship with your whole heart is about. You think you guys can do that and keep working on that every Sunday? Guess where else you can do that? At home, at school, on the street. How crazy would it be to worship God on the street? Hmm? Wouldn't that be cool? That would be really cool. Off. Don't you remember? Miss Holly. All right, boys and girls, we're going to pray and ask God to help us to worship him with our whole heart. You ready? You can repeat after me, okay? Say, dear God, we praise you. We adore you. Help us to worship you with our whole heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, boys and girls, you can go back. Thank you. I love that prayer because it ushers us into a new time of prayer as well. As we continue to pray and worship together, we come to a time of the prayers of the people. And this is a time where we get to gather together, where we get to go before God and before one another as well and speak about our joys and celebrate those, multiply our joys, and also divide our sorrows. And so before I open this up to uh, ask you if you have any prayer requests for yourself, for those you know, those you love, or the world itself, I want to let you know about some letters of well-wishing that we will be sending out to friends, neighbors, and people you may not know, but please support them in prayer because they are dear to all of us. We are sending a letter of well-wishing to Linda Thorpe, who is Adrian Barr's mom. Linda had a recent stroke and is receiving treatment for that, and we want to keep her in our prayers for recovery there. 
Also, we're sending a letter of well wishing to John Clark for hip replacement surgery. And at our earlier service this morning, we had two wonderful baptisms and got to welcome two lovely little lives into this church family. So we're sending a letter of well wishing to Paul Frederick Gordon and to Molly Alice Keeling. And I also ask that you keep the Hernandez family in your prayers. Susie Hernandez was a missionary that we supported in Mexico for years. Some of you may have met her personally or served with her in some capacity. And we are really sad to announce that Susie has passed on June 14th. She was only 42 years old, and this was very sudden. About a month ago, she had severe headaches, and so she was flown to Texas where she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And finding out about that tumor, they realized that it also spread throughout her body. She received hospice care until June 14th when she passed. And this is very sudden for our church family and for those who knew her personally and, and loved her well. So we ask that you hold the Hernandez family in your prayers throughout this week and today. And also, if you look to your right, as you already know, as always, you're welcome to fill out a purple prayer card, put it on our wooden board over there. Our staff prays over those every Tuesday. We care about what's going on in your life, so feel free to also use that space to um, let us know about anything we can pray for. So at this time, are there any any prayer concerns or any joys that we'd like to up uplift today? Yes, Carol. Oh, fantastic. Good news. Good news of recovery after surgery. Praise God. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Yes, Jenny. Yes, Liz, what a blessing it is. Yes, to see the Drosh family with us. We have been praying for them for a long time, and it is a thrill, thrill to have your presence with us. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Paul. Thank you. Yes, we'll be thinking of Doug, absolutely, and our new moderator installed on Tuesday. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Chris. Thank Yes, yes. Thank you, Th definitely. There's a lot, a lot that goes on. That's not just this week, but that's been prepared for a year. <laughs> yeah, a lot's going on. Bruce. Amen. Right, yeah, what a joy. What a joy to see George, a joy to see Liz. It is such a gift to see the presence of faces we love. Okay, well, friends, let's go to God in prayer. Oh, holy God, we are so grateful that you are here with us, that you are Emmanuel, that you are for us, and that you love us, that you delight in us. Because Psalm 18 reminds us that you reached down from heaven and rescued us. You drew us out of deep waters you led us to a place of safety because you, O oh God, you delight in us. And as Holly mentioned in her prayers, man, you delight in us. You delight in children, and we are all your children. And so we thank you, O oh Lord, for the gift of life that you have given us, for the ways in which you heal and renew our life. In the case of surgeries, in the case of recoveries, what a gift it is to see Liz, to have George in our presence. We thank you that you are a God who sustains us, who gives us peace, who gives us hope in the midst of trials and sorrows. And Lord, we lift up our friends who are receiving letters of well-wishing. We thank you so much for new life and what it means to get to baptize sweet Paul and Molly this morning that what it means to dedicate a life to you, O oh God, and to raise these kids up to know your name, Jesus. That is such a powerful, life-giving thing for all of us here at First Press. And we thank you for the new things you are doing in life, in our lives, and continue that you will protect those lives, that you will guide them on your way that is a way of truth and of life and of hope. And we also ask prayers for all the fathers in this room and those who cannot be with us today, but nonetheless are with us in spirit. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you give us teachers and you give us compassionate fathers and young men and boys in our lives to uh, lead well, like Micah 6.8 tells us. What does the Lord require of us but to do justice 
and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. O oh Lord, we pray that you will teach these fathers, young men and boys in this room, how to do just that with each sunrise. God, we also pray for peace and protesters' safety around the world and especially in places like Sudan, Hong Kong, Argentina, and Uruguay. We ask for protection over citizens of those countries who have suffered a lot already and who are merely using their right and their voices to speak up for justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly. And Lord, we also pray for our own country, for our leaders, our president, our local leaders here in the state and around the country as well, knowing that they have been entrusted with great power and with great power comes great responsibility. And we ask, Lord, that your wisdom will be each, in each man and woman who is serving our citizens, that they may unite to make wise decisions that are oriented towards justice and love for all. And we pray for our denomination. We pray for this presbytery specifically and lift up the dairies, and especially Doug, as he's taking a great call in his life to be moderator of this presbytery. And we thank you for his service and ask that you anoint him in wisdom and guidance to really empower this church and this denomination to do your work for your glory, O oh Lord. And we pray for the church around the world on this Trinity Sunday, asking that your spirit, O oh God, really enliven the church with your wisdom and your hope and your truth for all nations. We pray for our friends receiving letters of well-wishing, and we do all of this as your Son boldly taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. 
Good morning. It's great to see you all today. Uh, Tom McBride has been behind the tree. If you're just looking like, who's behind the tree? He's back there. So you're going to see him in a second. I'm so glad Tom is here. This is in preparation for our vacation Bible school. So it's going to be out for a couple weeks, but uh, if you look on this side, there's little windows where Tom can look out and see Martin. So it's really working really well. Harry Callahan was an inspector for the San Francisco Police Force in the Homicide Unit. Also, the character of a popular film series from the 1970s and 80s. Clint Eastwood, the actor, played the role in five films. Harry Callahan was nicknamed Dirty Harry because he was ruthless and violent, and he said everything with a sneer on his face. He could deliver the most cutting comments better than anybody else, almost anybody else in film history. Here are some of his most famous quotes, all of them spoken to unfortunate criminals that Harry Callahan caught, such as, go ahead, make my day. Or, you forgot your fortune cookie, it says, you're out of luck. And you got to ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you feel lucky, punk? I'd like to welcome our guest preacher for the summer. He's known as the teacher, or some call him the preacher, or the quester, or from the Hebrew, koheleth. He is the author of the book of Ecclesiastes. I had a friend of mine who once did PhD studies in the Old Testament at Notre Dame University, and he uh, said a wonderful line to describe this book and its author with these words. He read, one way to think of the teacher, or Koheleth, is that he was a preacher who knew the Bible like Billy Graham, but had the personality of Dirty Harry when he says, do you feel lucky? Well, do you feel lucky, punk? This summer, we're going to read through the whole book of Ecclesiastes as I, along with other preachers, will cover all 12 chapters of the book. I will tell you from the start that Ecclesiastes is a demanding book. There is going to be a Sunday that comes this summer where you're going to think to yourself, shut up, I am tired of listening to you, teacher. In fact, the rabbis debated for centuries whether or not this book should be included within Scripture. Some Christian scholars or students of the book will say there's no good news, no gospel found in Ecclesiastes. Famously, Ecclesiastes has always appealed to those who live in despair, who have a hopeless or bleak outlook on life. It was reported that during the Vietnam War, many military chaplains found that soldiers who were serving in that conflict could only read from this portion of the Bible. The book opens famously with these words, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What are we to make of our guest preacher, Dirty Harry? I want to urge you to pay close attention to his words and observations. He's not a cynic, although he sounds like one. The teacher sees the world as it is. He sees life as it really is. His approach is to challenge virtually everything that you hold dear and to call it into question. So today we begin with the beginning. I'm going to start by reading to you from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. So remember, Koheleth, the teacher, Dirty Harry, He has an aim in mind for you today, and that is to destroy or level every false hope and vain attempt to find meaning in life anywhere apart from God. So, listen carefully to the Word of God as it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. Everything is meaningless says the teacher, completely 
meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries round to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we're never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It's all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people will say, here's something new, but it's actually old. Nothing is never truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. Would you pray with me for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord today? Let us pray. Now, gracious God, I pray on behalf of my friends, but also for myself, that you would speak. Because, Lord, we need you to speak clearly, loudly, and unmistakably if we're going to live. Because we don't live by bread alone. We don't live by our careers alone. We don't live by our families or our possessions or our pleasures alone. We live by your word alone. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Has anyone ever told you to get real? Do you know what the expression means? Well, the Urban Dictionary says that to get real means to get a reality check. It's used when someone's living in a fantasy world, and that could be a company, a corporation, a whole country, when you're living in an illusion, when you're living in a fantasy world, it, well, it's time for you to get real to get with reality. Now, sometimes we get real because of something that takes place. And uh, for instance, you know, maybe you want to play a prank on your roommate, so you lube up the floor, so when he walks in, he falls down except it doesn't go very well. He comes in, and sure enough, he falls down, but he breaks his nose, his arm, and his neck. Well, now what you thought was going to be hilarious is kind of tragic. You've got to get him to the hospital. You've got to get the floor cleaned up. It's time to get real. The book of Ecclesiastes is the get real book of the Bible. It is written to help us live in reality and not in illusion. Now, for starters, the unknown author of Ecclesiastes uses a Hebrew word, hevel, 38 times in this book. All the rest of the occurrences found in the Old Testament amount to less than 40. This is the key word in the book of Ecclesiastes. What does it mean? Well, it gets translated into English, vanity or vapor, or meaningless, or smoke. So the teacher says, let's get real, because most of life is you grasping for smoke. You see, the teacher, or Koheleth, is a keen observer of the world. He notes the rhythms and the cycles of life, and when he sees life, he doesn't see wonder. He doesn't observe wonder by observing the way you and I live. He sees monotony. He observes. The sun comes up, and the sun goes down. Then it does it again and again. The same around. The wind blows north and the wind blows south here and there, twisting back and forth, getting nowhere. The rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again, and the waters to the rivers and flows out into the sea. Everything is weary and tiresome. No matter how much we see, we're never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. It's the same thing over and over and over again. The inbox on your email fills up, and then you empty it, and then it fills up again, and then you empty it, and it fills up again. 
like me, maybe you go food shopping on Monday, and by Saturday, the refrigerator is empty. So you go back and you fill it up again, and it empties again. You have homework that you do as students, or maybe you did. Now that you're on summer break, you got to do it, and then guess what? More homework to follow. That's the nature of life. A monotonous, dulling, boring routine. Hevel. Life is fleeting. Hevel. A riddle that you can't quite figure out. Here's a, another famous observation from the book of Ecclesiastes and the teacher, found in Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been will be, and what has been done will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. That should catch your attention because we live in a society that's always looking for the next technological advance, for the latest new restaurants, for the best new fad coming down the road. Here's what Koheleth, the teacher, thinks of fads. These are verses 10 and 11 found from the, the message. Someone call out, hey, this is new. Don't get excited. It's the same old story. Nobody remembers what happened yesterday and the things that will happen tomorrow, nobody will remember them either. Don't count on being remembered. The teacher, or Koheleth, slaps you in the face. You don't like it. But he's right, is he not? What will you do that will last nothing you're not lasting you won't be remembered a hundred years from now the work you do be forgotten the house you have will be gone the wealth you have it goes too this is hard but is it not true you see we create smoke and we think it's granite but I want to encourage you my friends to not despair because the teacher is actually providing for you an invaluable service. He is clearing away the debris of your life, the smoke, in order that the lasting can be found. Or if you think of a vase that needs to be cleared so that the flowers can be put in, the book of Ecclesiastes is about this process. Rick Warren is a pastor of the Saddleback Church in Southern California, big mega church, the author of a best-selling book that probably most people here have read, The Purpose Driven Life. That book has sold more books than almost any other book in history, millions and millions and millions of copies. In the year 2006, Rick Warren was invited to speak at a TED Talk, and he was asked just to reflect upon the experience of writing this book. And he said in that talk that people always said to him, what was it like for you to be the author of this book that's an incredible bestseller? And he said, well, first of all, I was surprised because I don't consider myself to be an author. So perhaps more than anybody else, I was shocked by the popularity of the book. But then he went on to say that he touched on a nerve. I think what Rick Warren touched on is the same nerve that the teacher, Koheleth, T touches on in the book of Ecclesiastes that there's a difference a huge difference between existing and living Rick Warren explained it this way here's how we live we get up, we go to work, we come home, we watch TV or stare at the computer then we get up, we go to work we come home, we watch TV or stare at the computer we get up, we go to work, we come home we stare at the TV or the computer and on the weekends we go to parties, we take our kids to their games, and we go to the grocery store. Then we start it all over again on Monday. That is not living. That is existing. The questions raised by Koheleth and Rick Warren are not particularly religious questions. They are very much human questions. What does it mean to be human? For there is a difference between living and existing. Most people exist. Living out their days on a merry-go-round. Stop, says the teacher. Look, listen, get real 
with what is vapor-like in your life, which is just about everything. For now, and we're just at the beginning of the book, for now, just come to terms with that. Just shake hands with that reality. Stop your vapor living. Turn to the one who is lasting and eternal. That one is God. Find him now. In his introduction to his paraphrase of the book of Ecclesiastes, author Eugene Peterson makes a very helpful insight into where the author of Ecclesiastes is driving. He notes that animals, dogs, cats, goldfish, they don't really seem to worry very much uh, about the meaning of life. They're pretty happy being dogs, fish, and, um, and cats. But human beings, well, we are driven by this desire to be more or other than we, what we find ourselves to be. We explore the countryside, he says, for excitement, search our souls for meaning, shop the world for pleasure. We try this, then we try that, and the usual fields of exploration for us, the typical places we go, include money, sex, power, adventure, and knowledge, as well as, particularly here in this community, career, wealth, and status. Everything we try is so promising at first, Peterson says, but nothing ever seems to amount to very much, so we try harder. But the harder we work at it, the less we get out of it. So some people just give up, and they settle for a humdrum life. But there are others who seem to be so intent on trying to grasp it, on trying to get what is lasting, but in so doing, they become less and less human by the year. The teacher brings to us a critical, welcome, cool skepticism to all of the seductive suggestions for meaning swirling around us, promising us everything but delivering us nothing. So what the teacher does is he clears the air. And once the air is cleared, we are finally ready for reality. We are ready for God. So punk... What's it going to be? Existing or living? Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, I pray on behalf of my friends today that you would help us to leave space today and in the days to come for quiet growth, for new ideas, for dreams and new insights for new perspectives and new directions, for listening to your quiet but persistent voice. That you would lead us, Lord, into the very heart of your will for us. We give you room to help us see the futility of our living. Let us not be impatient, afraid of the silence or the calm. Let us learn to wait until the breath of the Holy Spirit fills our sails and we can set forth on a course secure in the knowledge that it is you who have charted the course for us. We pray this for ourselves and for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this song? Yeah. Uh-huh.
Good morning, I'm Bruce Melson, and I'm an elder here at the church, and it's my opportunity, and it's a good opportunity to speak to you about the 23rd FPCM Way of the Week. You'll find it on pictures all over the church. You may find it behind me on the board. I'm not sure what's at my back right now. But it says something like this. Worship with your whole heart. Your life is meant to be an act of worship. Every breath, action, and thought flows from God and can bring Him glory. Praise God everywhere and embrace the opportunities to regularly worship with your church family. I find those, those words surprisingly or not so surprisingly close to Deuteronomy 10:12, where Israel is being spoken to and it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. That's giving praise to God. In a like manner, Psalm 150 uh, says multiple times, and I'll only read the last line, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, exclamation point, and then praise the Lord. We're to be praising the Lord. We've been doing that by song. We've been doing that in our lives when we can, but sometimes our lives get crippled by bad circumstances or a job loss. Maybe someone has passed. Maybe, a maybe someone in your family is at odds with us. And uh, other times are, are good times, but somehow we don't always carry so well this communication with our Lord over these issues. We isolate ourselves or step away from what is being taught to us in, in our faith. And it's not just always that easy to come away with these words that we should be worshiping every breath, action, and thought flow from God because sometimes we give up on God. He does not give up on us. Amen? And I'm thinking, how do we give walking shoes to this message this morning? And I thought back quite a few years now, 
Um, my wife went to James Madison University. It was Madison College then, a much smaller school than today. And she attended a fellowship by a Mennonite man and his wife who invited college students to their home to bring the gospel to them, to plant seeds there. I didn't tell you that he was a missionary to India many years prior to that and probably spent 15 years in India, planted seeds all over the place, never saw them come to fruition. Finished up 15, 20 years worth of missionary work there, came home to Harrisonburg, and I guess somehow started this fellowship. Maybe the Holy Spirit led that, do you think? And brought kids from college into his house. Now we're talking about the 60s and the early 70s. We're talking, and this sounded odd, but I, I, I guess it doesn't sound odd because I see it today. Uh, ripped jeans, bare feet, tie-dyed shirts, uh, a whole different, uh, you know, long men with long hair. We still have some of that today, but it was really on the cutting edge back then, especially if you were a college age student. They weren't used to it. They showed up, Mr. and Mrs. Nist did, in their, he in his long black pants and his suspenders and his collared shirt, and she in her long dress with an apron and a bonnet on top. But they invited students, as, as difficult it might have been to get to know these people, into their house to teach the Word of God, counting on God to plant the seeds and bring the seeds to fruition. And didn't he? Yes, he did. It, it went for years. And it was my opportunity then to go one year and, and be with my wife and, and visit there again and see it later down the road. And shortly before Mr. Nissa's death, he was a, a Mennonite, uh, the group, of, an, a group of generations of that Bible study met in a field and, and uh, had a picnic, had a get together of this fellowship, now 15, 20 years old. Many of them had their own children, brought them, and they were sitting and fellowshipping and meeting other people that had come under the tutelage of, of the Nisses. But don't you know, in the midst of this, this ambulance crept in from the side and crept up and parked, and everybody stopped strumming the guitars and stopped talking and looked, and wasn't it Mr. and Mrs. Niss? She got out of the ambulance. They wheeled him out on his stretcher and pulled him up into the midst of the crowd. And the crowd actually gathered around him. They put their children on his lap to introduce him to another generation of them. These were all Christian people. He may not have seen and realized what he did overseas, but people came to the Lord in India by droves. And in Harrisonburg, Virginia, the same thing happened. People came to the Lord in droves. And seeing him, and they had been playing other things, they stopped and they started strumming an old hymn. That was his favorite. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior thou art. If ever I love thee, Lord Jesus is now. And they, they joined in that. And they went into the second, surf, uh, second stanza, and a lot of people played out on that one because they didn't memorize it like they did the first stanza. Got to the third stanza and all you heard was guitar strumming. But when it was obvious that no one was singing, we heard this weak old voice speak up as he stretched up on his haunches on his stretcher and sang, in mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore you in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow if ever I love you. Lord Jesus, it is now. That was his communication back with God, back to the Holy Spirit, that I see what you've done, God. I've seen the fruit coming forward that was planted. This is the type of thing we're talking about here, this quorum deo, a Latin phrase, meaning being in the presence of God, but with all of your life and all of the time. The 23rd way of the week. And would you pray that we would go out to uh, worship God with our heart and soul and mind and strength? Will you offer a prayer blessing on the hands you hold? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you. 
May the Lord's face shine with joy because of you. And may the Lord look deeply into your eyes and grant you peace. And may that peace which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds at rest in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you.